So, is a junior resource sector bull market ever coming back and what does it take? We are now in the eighth year of a bear market. And that bull was bought by Joe Martin and Dave Hodge, I think in 2011 when things were growing absolutely fantastic and it's been downhill ever since. What does it take to end this uh, bear market? I say we take sledgehammers, go down to the warehouse where they are hiding this thing, smash it to pieces and break the curse. <laughs> the blue is the value traded on the venture exchange by resource companies. The green is the non-resource companies. And you can see that from 2011 on, it's been just a shriveling of the value traded on the venture for the resource juniors, and it's been replaced by money going into cannabis, blockchain, all kinds of other stuff. And we had a bit of a turnaround in 2016, but that's already starting to fade. It really didn't uh, uh, have any staying power. And the, the, the yellow line is the average traded value. That spike you see in the past week, that was when Atlantic Gold got the takeover bid from St. Barbara, and all of a sudden we had that stock trading uh, way more than what was normal for the resource juniors. It's down to 10 to $20 million a day is traded with amongst the 1,100 or so resource juniors on the venture exchange. Financing activity. Uh, looks like a little bit of a turnaround in the past couple months after a very dismal start, but Half of that is dominated by four companies, advanced companies, uh, you know, Barkerville, Bluestone, uh, Victoria Gold, uh, feasibility demonstration going into production type companies. Uh, the rest of the, the smaller companies are having an extremely tough time raising money for their exploration projects. And the picture, the health of the system keeps getting worse. The 1,200, uh, uh, TSX Venture uh, resource companies, uh, 500 have zero to negative working capital. And uh, there's maybe 400 left that have enough money to get something going. Now this is not necessarily a bad thing. And on the right, I've got two companies. Above is Nevada Exploration Inc., which has been one of my eternal picks, and below that is Gold Standard, which uh, has been sort of a you know, big money backed uh, exploration play uh, in, uh, in Nevada. If Nevada Exploration Inc. were to actually be successful and deliver a world-class Carlin-type discovery, 500 resource juniors would instantly die because what it has taken this company to bring the story to this point where they're within striking range of making a, uh, uh, a world-class discovery is millions of dollars of setting up the target, establishing it, vector drilling. This is the new normal for what it takes to make the kind of discovery that gives you the, the, the 10, 20, sometimes 50 uh, times gains, which is the reason that we are here. So right now I have 500 companies hoping that these guys do not do this because then that will become the model, the template for what's required. And if we break it down to 500 companies that are serious, then the capital will flow into them and there won't be all this money wasted on the lifestyle juniors that have no chance of ever accomplishing anything productive. So here I've got kind of a, a snapshots of the different types of stories that drive the market. Like what does it take to bring back this bull that supposedly always follows the bear. Um, obviously a gold price uptrend, and we haven't had anything since uh, uh, sort of uh, in that department since it fell back in, uh, in late 2011, and I think it was uh, August. Uh, uh, gold is the magic uh, 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 driver for, that brings money in into the optionality plays, even into discovery exploration plays, uh, but it requires you to have a pessimistic outlook about the future. Now, the base metal price uptrend, that's driven by business cycles and super cycles, which erupt upon us and always catch the mining supply cycle off guard, and so that's why you get these big price booms. But we haven't really had anything big in this department since the super cycle, so base metals have been tracking sideways. In the last few years, we've uh, gone into security of supply, 
the innovation kind where new technology, electric vehicles, create new demand for materials that are in balance with existing applications like cobalt and so on. And so you get sort of spikes and it gets everybody excited. But as you can see, the cobalt uh, price bubble has pulled back and now it's a very subdued play. And then there is one that I think is going to make a comeback, which we first saw in 2011, which is supply disruption. Uh, type of uh, security of supply story. And that was when the rare earths suddenly uh, were taken offline by China in response to the uh, 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 Senkanku Island uh, uh, dispute uh, with, between Japan and, and China. And, uh, and that, of course, was great for the 30, 40 companies that were in that space. And then there's the weird one that I've been backing, a different type of security supply, Scandium International, bringing on stream a metal for which uh, there has never been any primary scalable supply, but they have the chicken and egg problem to solve because nobody wants to tee up the demand to take this stuff uh, until it's actually in place. So that can, if, if they can crack that problem, plays like that, but those are few and far between. And what's dominated much of that financing activity that you saw in the past uh, since 2016 is the hybrid optionality discovery play. That's where you have an existing system that doesn't work at the metal price that you have, and you rethink it and spend a lot of money. And Cisco Mining has put $200 million into rethinking windfall uh, as a, a very different beast from what it was originally understood. And that's resulted in, you know, maybe several dozen companies hoovering up much of the capital that is, was available for this space. And then, the, then there's the two discovery types. There's the isolated discovery, like in Arizona mining, which suddenly comes out of nowhere. Everybody's on board, makes a ton of money, but nobody expects anybody else to make something uh, similar. And then the kind that has always made this space super exciting is the kind that's an area play, where somebody comes across something in a somewhat unexpected fashion, and it's big, and all of a sudden, all kinds of other juniors have a piece of it or are able to grab a piece of it, and the glass goes half full for everything. And we haven't really had anything like that since the Ring of Fire. So gold, the problem with gold is that uh, the gold bugs perceive a thumbs up for gold now as a thumbs down for Trump. And they're all pretty much Trump fans. And you look at the, the, uh, uh, the debts going up, uh, uh, you know, protectionism is the opposite of the free trade stuff. Uh, you know, Trump's doing a bunch of uh, Democrat stuff. And uh, the other day I saw an article saying that, okay, these uh, uh, social media trolls are now starting a hate Trump campaign. I said, wow, I wonder if Rick Rule is behind that, trying to get the Democrats reelected so that we can get the gold bugs back on track liking gold. Now, the gold bugs don't actually buy gold that much. They buy the juniors as a proxy for gold. So right now, with gold going nowhere, and with you know, making a thumbs up, thumbs down type gesture by supporting it, they're absent from our market. The real money that buys gold is in denial on the sidelines, hoping that all the policy initiatives in the United States are just a, a reality TV show that's gonna go away and everything will go back to normal. But what's happening is the changes that are being set in motion are, all, are now irreversible. I mean, the United States crafted the New World Order after, after 1945. They had to deal with the Soviet Union. They won that battle. They've been the undisputed leader ever since. They've done it through subtle soft power. But part of the whole free market thing was, OK, we go move our capital into the lowest cost jurisdiction. And when communism pretty much died in China and everywhere, well, America got hollowed out. And that's got people very angry. And it's got people angry almost everywhere in the Western world. And now China has gotten large enough that everybody's realized they are a serious threat. And the hopes that China would become like America, become more of an open economy, uh, this is reversed. Xi Jinping is now a leader for life. Uh, they have a hyper-surveillance system in place. Uh, uh, it is a dictatorship 
that now wants to rule the world. So Trump standing up to this and saying, this can't go on, also has the backing of the Democrats, who are always uh, against this idea of free trade and uh, you know, moving capital in the lowest uh, cost jurisdiction where there are also no pollution controls or any of the other costs associated in the uh, more advanced nation. So we now have a problem, this showdown happening from which there is no backing down. Trump has asked China, you must give up your plan to uh, you know, be the technology leader by 2025. Uh, you need to uh, uh, um, stop uh, this uh, you know, running through state companies, stealing our technology and all this stuff. But China can't back down. This is an impossible problem that we have. And this graphic, which I first started showing in 2008, and it's always the pink line and the blue line, the relative percentage of the global economy represented by the United States and China. And it's converging. It's expected to be equal by 2030. And now the difference is not that much at all. And you can see in a mere five years, which would be the end of Trump's second term, it will be even closer. So this situation, and, and of course China's uh, and military expenditure has gone up. America's is still overwhelmingly the largest uh, uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, this pattern will not go away. And that's why we have to still keep hope on gold. And I've also used this graphic on the left for the last 10 years, and that's basically the value of all the existing above ground gold stock uh, divided by global GDP. And you can see it went nuts in 1980, up to 25%, and below 4% when the United States won the Cold War. And during that uh, 2011 run, uh, it got to 14%, but it's been kind of flat lining. But if you take those percentages in the chart on the right, and apply them to the current situation, and you have the same kind of extraordinary stresses that the world experienced uh, in 1980 when the United States appeared to be losing it, $3,300 uh, uh, is the equivalent of 850 gold back then. And normally you say, well, this is gonna happen because of inflation. That's not very interesting because the costs go up. But the stressor type of move, a violent move where suddenly everybody says, this is irreparable, this is a disaster. Um, uh, that could cause that kind of move. And if that happens, it's a real price move, then everybody will want back into the junior game. But until it does, we have to just bide our time and try to endure and wait for that to happen. Now, the problem, this is another graphic I created in 2008 that I keep using, and it's becoming reality now. This standoff between China and the United States is going to result in fragmenting the uh, global economic zones. It might even prevent goods moving. All we need is for this standoff to achieve a military uh, uh, dimension. Like say China decides to annex Taiwan to get the chip making capacity that is now being denied to Huawei. And uh, what's going to happen then? Well, then that changes everything. Then China is asserting its uh, military supremacy in at least its backyard. And that would be another big trigger for everybody saying, oh boy, time to own gold. And the Americans have woken up to this. They published this draft list of critical metals where uh, what if we get a fragmented world like that where stuff doesn't naturally f flow uh, via free trade channels to uh, whoever's willing to pay for it from the lowest cost jurisdiction. And uh, the ones that I think are really important are antimony, um, rare earths, scandium too, because most of it comes from China, except uh, a bit of it from uh, the Philippines, and that's all being uh, bought by Bloom Energy for its Bloom boxes, and then tungsten. These other ones, magnesium them, that can actually be made anywhere, vanadium, they have uh, you know, Russia and South Africa as sources. But the, the graphic on the right, the red is what China represents in terms of like total supply, and this is from 2012, but it hasn't changed, uh, changed that much. So the Americans have a serious vulnerability. So they can't allow this thing to really spin out of control. 
But if we have this stalemate, the anxiety that this could go crazy creates a new narrative. And we had rare earth mania one, and uh, you can see how high the prices got, 10 to 20 times what they were normally. Now they are even cheaper. China still dominates global supply. It was caused uh, supposedly by a dispute over the uh, um, Senkaku Islands, which the uh, Chinese call Daiodo or something like that. And, uh, and it was used as an excuse by China to force manufacturing to China where they could have a domestic supply of rare earths. And China doesn't really export a huge amount of rare earths. It exports downstream technology. So this is a big, big problem. All this stuff that goes into electric vehicles, uh, uh, turbines, uh, uh, other things that use you know, super magnets, uh, that's downstream stuff being manufactured in China. And if this power struggle turns into shutting down of trade, the Western world, or at least the United States, has a serious problem. So I think we're going to head into a, a rare earth mania too. And this one's going to be different. Like the price decks from that period, 2012 to 14, when those juniors you know, figured out what it took to mine this stuff, the, their price assumptions are all uh, three to 10 times higher than the reality now. And back then, the juniors never actually caught up to the um, value valuations implied by the rare earth prices. It's like, this is insane, you know. Quest, Quest rare metals should be uh, you know, worth $50, $50 a share if uh, you plug in these numbers. This time we're gonna have a different type of mania and this might actually pull in millennials. These deposits are going to be revived and even though they're worthless at the current rare earth prices, the possibility that a train wreck happens as a result of the standoff means the prices would go up 10 times and there'd be a massive scramble to put these things into production. So we will see rare earth companies, and this is a speculation on my part, start to get valuations that are not grounded in price reality. And it becomes a different type of proxy for the gold bugs because it represents America's ability to respond to the consequences of pushing this standoff with China to its extreme limit. So we could watch, watch rare earth stories become revived. Linus right now has had a bid from West Farmers, which is a big conglomerate with too much money. They've rejected that. Malaysia uh, is saying you can't keep producing it. Linus is the only independent producer that doesn't ship any of its uh, products to, to China. Uh, it's going to become the superstar. It's now st strategic importance. They're even going to build a separation facility in Texas uh, uh, so that uh, this uh, you know, ability to produce this stuff is in, within a United States controlled jurisdiction. So that could mean this becomes the aggregator going after these other companies. And this could be a little bubble of joy for our sector. It doesn't help the majority of companies, but it could be something that focuses people back on this space. And bubble dynamics, um, you know, the upgoing, you know, metal prices trending higher creates bubble activity. When Greg was describing uh, all the fun he had in 2002 to 2007, that was driven by expectations that there was no limit to these metal prices. But the kind of bubbles that I'm most interested in are the S-curve bubbles that come from discovery exploration, where you start off with just the target and you deliver something that works at the metal prices we have. And that's been a tough slog in the last while because it, you need to think a lot. You need to visualize what is the size of the price? How is, is it being priced right now? And cannabis is so much easy. I mean, IROC, dumps all over the juniors every time they have some little decimal in the wrong place or, or, or a wrong syllable or, or whatever. Well, a cannabis company cannot possibly be wrong about anything that, it say, that they say, so they can say anything. And IROC has nothing to worry about with those companies. And so it's a big momentum game, whereas we're stuck delivering fundamental reality. And here's... Um, sort of a history, the area play history. Uh, the bottom row are the ones that actually became area plays, and the ones above it, like uh, 
Perina and Fruta del Norte Penasquito Borden, they were great successes, but they did not have a contagious effect uh, uh, in, in a broader area. And the Ring of Fire was the last time we had a true insane movement of uh, money capital into the juniors uh, following Noron's discovery, what looked like it was a tentacle of an octopus uh, similar to uh, Voises Bay ovoid. And in the end, it turned out to just be a tentacle and not something substantial. So it was an area play that failed to turn into a mine. But we need something like that to come back to us. Now, the two companies that are in my session here today, um, one is uh, Zephyr Minerals. It's a kind that's not going to have an area play implication if it delivers what it's going after. So it, the, the land position is such that they've got the special segment, and if they find a broken hill type system, then you have a monster play and you can make a ton of money in that particular stock. In January, I had PJX here doing a similar target, a deep target, which if it turns out to be a uh, 100 million ton, uh, you know, 20% zinc lead uh, deposit with a significant silver credit, well then that stock does extremely well. And southeastern BC where the Sullivan II hunt's been going on forever, that could actually ignite area play. And the one that I've been watching closely since uh, October is Midland's Mithril Project in Quebec, the James Bay area. The whole area is ailing right now. It's had the, a gold exploration rush based on Eleonora, but Eleonora, you know, in retrospect, should not have been put into production. Uh, the lithium bubble, which drew a lot of companies like 92 Resources into this area because of its uh, preponderance of pegmatites. Uh, um, lithium's down to a third of where it was before, and and, and that's not a, a, a you know, commodity play that's going to come back soon. But Midland found something that's copper that was not available to be found by the past exploration methods that people were applying. So it's conceivable that if this is something big and substantial, there's stuff all over. You need to put on different binoculars and start looking for it. And there's all these companies that own all this land for other reasons that are now very watching very closely what Midland Exploration is up to. Their first pass of exploration did not deliver the goods. The great Canadian area play potential is still just a wish and a dream, but they're going back in there. And the nature of this play is such that uh, they could yet pile into something absolutely substantial. And I'd like to take people back to the Voises Bay days when Diamond Fields uh, had that Reed Brook interest, intrusive and drilled the dike and the stock ran to 12 bucks and everybody said, oh, it's a bunch of BS, the widths are not very big and all that and, and Friedland was you know, pounding the drum. And then they did the geophysics in the area and came up with this funny ring structure and said, oh, this is interesting, uh, EM rings target and they're drilling the ring and coming up with nothing. And somebody said, uh, um, um, well, why don't you drill the middle of it? Uh, it's, it's empty because it's off scale. And they did, and pulled 100 meters of engine block that ran 4% nickel and 3% copper, and everybody, oh, magmatic segregation deposit, wow, 30 million ton deposit, and then suddenly the whole area, area went crazy. So we are in the early days of follow, looking for something new and different, copper, uh, high grade, potentially open pitable in James Bay, it would bring in the infrastructure that Quebec and its plan Nord wants to happen over there. And, uh, and it would put in huge amounts of money because the glass is half full for everybody. And even the gold potential has only been barely assessed in that area. There hasn't been enough risk capital to go in there. When you get something big, like when Ikadi was found, diamonds, diamonds, we ever heard of diamonds, the, an area the size of Switzerland was staked and there were more Kimberlites uh, that became mines found outside of what uh, Fipke said, who said he got it all with his ECADI package, and it turned out to not be true. We need something like this to break onto the, onto the screen, to have the financial media start talking about it again, pulling capital in, and uh, rebuilding the audience uh, to build on fundamental outcomes, not just the momentum trades. And so bringing the millennials into this space and getting them to understand it, 
This is critical. So to a large degree, it is also an education program that we need to uh, uh, undertake to bring back an audience that could be lost forever. And there may, it, it need not be the case that a bull market follows this bear market. It could actually be in permanent decline. And on that happy note, I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, uh, it's, I've got the Discovery Watch stuff. Follow me on Twitter. I send out a uh, Twitter notice when I've uh, done these. These are, these are, these are free uh, audio th interviews that I, do. I talk about stuff I've already written to my paying subscribers uh, afterwards. Uh, and keep an eye on the space, even if you feel reluctant to do anything. Keep watching it, because something's going to happen that's going to suddenly wake it up, and then it'll be a very violent, profitable waking up. Thank you. Thank you.